again to all of you. It's our honor and pleasure to have you all with us this evening at the Embassy as our distinguished guests. As part of Embassy's Understanding India series of cultural events, we are pleased to present this evening a talk titled How India Discovered Vasco da Gama by the very well-known distinguished and celebrated historian, Dr. Sanjay Subramanyam, who is a professor and Doshi Chair at, in Indian History at UCLC at the University of California, Los Angeles. To welcome the guest today and to formally introduce Dr. Sanjay Subramanyam, I would request and call upon Mr. M. Shridharan, who is Embassy's Consular and Head of Press Information and Culture Wing. Mr. M. Shridharan. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's my distinct pleasure and privilege to welcome all of you in this evening. July 4th holiday, after that Monday, rainy day, and yet the hall is full of enthusiasts. And uh, we are very honored to have the presence of His Excellency, Ambassador Nuno Brito of Portugal, and uh, the diplomatic corps, people from the think tanks, and journalists, academics, and this is a very, very august occasion. And uh, we are, from the embassy side also, we are happy that our ambassador is also here. She has made some time for this also. I will briefly say about the program, which is uh, part of our Understanding India series. And we are trying to feature talks which provide a cross-section view of India from a specific perspective or a comprehensive view. And this talks very much falls in the overall idea of this, talk, uh, this series. And I have been given the pleasure of uh, introducing Dr. Sanjay Subramanyam. I will try to be brief, but you will understand when I finish that it is not easy job. Sanjay is a doctorate in economics who is a professor of history. That's just a beginning. He taught economic history in the Delhi School of Economics, where he became the doctor, and later moved on to Paris, School for Advanced Studies of Social Sciences, where he again taught about pre-Indian history and the European movement and other things. Later, he went on to Oxford, where at least the legend says that Oxford had to change the rules so that he will become the first chair of Indian history and culture, because he was too young for Oxford's rule for a chair. And they changed the rule so that he will become the first chair. After that, he moved on to UCLA, where he is currently. And he is a founding chair of Indian history and culture. Uh, sorry, uh, Chair of India and South Asia in UCLA. And he's also, uh, where do I start? He's a managing editor of this journal. He's a managing editor of Judge Journal. Uh, his select list of publications run beyond 28. And I counted, and after that, I left it. And he's also the board of editors for the Cambridge History of the World, which is coming up and he'll be doing two volumes. And uh, apart from that, he has been well endowed with awards also, A.D. White Professor Award for, of the Cornell University. And 2012, he got Infosys Award for Humanities. And he is currently the Klug Chair at the Library of Congress. The chair is for countries and cultures of the South, which means that he will get into the Library of Congress resources and make research in these areas. And uh, he's not very old, uh, so <laughs> we are yet to see the rest of Sanjay. And he's a polyglot. When we sat for a dinner a few days ago, we asked him, uh, especially my wife asked him, I understand you're a polyglot. And uh, typically he said, not necessarily. People say it depends what you mean by it. And then he started counting. And uh, it was going beyond this. 
so he started with, of course, uh, Tamil, his mother tongue, then Malayalam, Kerala, Telugu, covered Marathi, Tulu, Hindi, Bengali, Bihari. And after that, he went on to French, uh, Spanish, Portuguese, and uh, Persian, and uh, Urdu. And after that, I just focused on ordering food, which I am uh, <laughs> On a serious note, in one of the interviews, Sanjay says, uh, somebody is asking him, what do you want to do? I mean, you are an economist, and uh, you are now teaching history. What do you want, to, what are you trying to do? And he says, I'm trying to change the terms of the debate. As a serious historian, I think this is one of the fundamental duties of a historian, to change the terms of a debate. Through this speech, this is essentially what he would be doing. Instead of talking about how Vasco da Gama discovered India, he's going to talk about how India discovered Vasco da Gama. So this is some theory in action, which is very good for an historian and an economist. Uh, before I wind up, I'm going to request our uh, ambassador, Madam Nirupama Rao, to present a bouquet to Sanjay and then make a few remarks. Thank you. <laughs> Professor Subramaniam, Ambassador Brito, Dr. Devaki Jain, uh, the <coughs> eminent social scientist who is also visiting us uh, at this time. Now, after that uh, introduction by our Councillor for Press, Information and Culture, Mr. Sridharan, I do not want to stand in the way of what promises to be a most interesting lecture. I am personally thrilled that Dr. Sanjay Subramaniam is here at the Embassy in our midst today in order to address us. As Sridharan has pointed out, he is a historian of no mean repute, he possesses a formidable reputation as a challenger, in my view, of orthodoxies, as Sridharan said, ch changing the terms of the debate, and a destroyer of shibboleths. The other day, I came across a stray sentence in a book on one of the great temples of Kerala, my home state, saying that we, as Indians, are more influenced in our lives by our mythologies rather than by our histories. That, I realize, is a debatable statement. I have no doubt in my mind that our identities are forged on the anvil of history. But it is the interpretation of that history that is ridden with complexity, generating debate and even conflict, and which politicizes our everyday existence. I also happened to be in Calicut, Kerala, last week, just six days ago, the city to which, as the history books tell us, the Portuguese mariner and aspiring grandee, Vasco da Gama, came in search of the riches of the Orient. He arrived on the coast of India in, the May, in May of 1498, and that was a significant event in our modern history. And the era of conquest exploitation and colonialism that ensued levied great costs and imposed great adversity on a thriving and prosperous country. Today, of course, we have re-emerged from those shadows. I've had the occasion to hear a few of Professor Subramaniam's lectures in their recorded versions previously. I can assure you that you will find what he has to say immensely interesting grounded in solid research of diverse historical materials and truly fascinating. Ladies and gentlemen, I have great pleasure in welcoming Professor Subramaniam and inviting him to the podium. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here and uh, it's a great pleasure to return to something which I actually worked on now uh, a good number of years ago, but which I'm constantly called upon uh, to, to return uh, to in one fashion or another. 
In fact, just a week ago, I was actually um, in touch with uh, a couple of Indian newspapers, uh, notably the Hindu, because of the fact that one of the texts that I will be talking about today actually is in the process of being elevated by the UNESCO into a world treasure. And uh, so there was the question of what the status of this text was, uh, who was it written by, who was it written for, and so on. And the difficulty we have with uh, the history that I'm going to be talking about is that it is the history of an encounter, but an encounter which is rather difficult to seize from the two ends. Okay. So here is one version of the encounter. If we could get these lights down a little bit, it might help us for the contrast. So this is a painting which some of you will know which hangs in the Geographical Society in Lisbon, in the Sociedad de Geografia. And it's a late uh, 19th century oil painting. It's a very romantic painting. And it shows a scene, not a historical scene, but a scene from the Portuguese national epic, right? the, the Luzia there, in which uh, Vasco da Gama, the person whom you see over here, is addressing the Zamorin, as he's called, or what in India we would call the Samudri, Samudri Raja of Calicut, who is uh, surrounded by his courtiers and his minions, some of whom, as you can see, look suitably sinister. And uh, he is, in fact, uh, declaiming to him the glories of Portugal. So this is one version of an encounter which allegedly took place in 1498, in the month of May, uh, in the southwestern coast of India. So uh, in the town of Calicut that you see over here. And um, it is an encounter which, uh, in a way, uh, stands uh, side by side with a number of other famous encounters of roughly the same period. We know, for instance, when Columbus, who was Vasha da Gama's contemporary and may even have known him, we can't be entirely certain, uh, when he arrived in the Caribbean in 1492, uh, there was no court to greet him. He uh, met uh, essentially uh, people uh, who were in dispersed settlements. Uh, we have no record of what they thought of him. We have no record of how they perceived him. And the same is even true of another very famous encounter which took place, which is perhaps, uh, in a sense, uh, more disappointing still from the point of view of the lack of a counterpart to the European account, which is the famous moment when the Spanish conquistador Hernan Cortes arrives in Tenochtitlan, the city of Mexico, uh, and, uh, in 1519, and proceeds to meet uh, the Mexica ruler Moctezuma. Now, um, these episodes or these meetings can be put side by side, and many people often tend to do that, though actually they are very different meetings. They're very different meetings for a number of different reasons. We know what happened when Columbus went into the Caribbean. We know that, in effect, the societies of the Caribbean were destroyed within about 20 years. They were almost entirely depopulated, and no trace remains of those populations uh, at the other end of the encounter. What happened in Mexico was more complicated because, again, between 1519 and, let's say, about 1540, there was an enormous demographic collapse. Uh, there were uh, a major uh, restructuring of the indigenous societies. Uh, and there was uh, a tremendous amount of, uh, uh, of a kind of shakeup that took place, which eventually ended up creating a Spanish empire, which, of course, penetrated very deep into the inland. Nothing of this kind happened in, in, in India. So at that level, it's not the same kind of an encounter. It is not an encounter in which uh, the societies of southwestern India or the societies of the Indian Ocean see very deeply fundamental changes taking place. These are, it's a much more gradualist kind of, of change. And in fact, you can even debate the extent to which there is a straight line to be drawn between Vasco da Gama in the end of the 15th century and, let's say, Robert Clive in the middle of the 18th century. In fact, there is no straight line, in my opinion at least, to be drawn from this moment of arrival and a later moment of conquest. It's a much more complex history than that. So we have 
that as a, as a difference. And why does that happen? Well, it happens for a rather obvious reason. And it happens for the simple reason that in spite of the fact that the Vikings were, as we now well know, in contact with America, we know from the digs in, uh, in Newfoundland and so on, that there were Viking settlements there. Nevertheless, there was no continuous contact. And therefore, Europe and America were not a part of the same uh, disease re regime. And so as a consequence, what happened effectively was the arrival of the Europeans was not only disastrous because the Europeans came armed with weapons and with technologies that the indigenous peoples of America were not familiar with, but also because the Europeans, without knowing it, brought microbes and diseases into the American system, which the American system could not cope with. The difference with Asia was enormous because, first of all, as we all know, Eurasia is a single landmass. And furthermore, it's very important to remember that uh, places like Calicut, or places like Cochin for the south, which also had extensive dealings with the Portuguese, in fact, were not seeing Europeans for the first time. So, for instance, when Vasco da Gama arrives, or rather the people from his ships uh, disembark and come on shore, they're actually rather surprised to find something. Because what do they actually find? The first Portuguese to arrive uh, on land from the fleet of Vasco da Gama in India is someone who probably, we are not entirely certain, was a man called João Nunes. He was what is called in the terminology of the time, a degredado. A degredado is someone who is a convict, uh, who is sent into exile uh, as a way of punishing him. That is to say, instead of putting him in prison, you send him on uh, uh, a kind of a, uh, an exiled, uh, in, in an exiled situation so that he can undertake uh, dangerous missions. Why? Because he's expendable. So when you arrive at a place, at, an, at a port where you're not exactly sure of what is going to happen, the person whom you send on shore first is a person whom you don't particularly care whether he comes out of it alive. So Jean Nunes or someone of that kind is sent on shore, and we know this famous episode which takes place, which is he arrives and he meets, who does he meet? He actually meets two people from Tunis, from North Africa, who are already there. So people from the Mediterranean are already there to, to greet this man, and they say to him that famous phrase, uh, what the devil brought you here? And he replies, of course, we came here to seek Christians and spices. Right. But what is actually interesting is not only that he's able to have this conversation, but that he actually is able to have this conversation in what language? In a mixture, we are told, of Castilian and Genoese. Right? So there are people in Kerala already speaking Castilian and Genoese, or so some kind of a Mediterranean uh, lingua franca, which contains elements of these two. And we know from the first two Portuguese ex uh, expeditions that uh, he, these people were not exceptions. They were not very numerous such people, but there were some of them. I'll give you one example. That there was a Venetian trader whom the Portuguese encountered in their first expeditions, whose name was Bonaiuto d'Albano, who was from the Campo di San Bartolomeo in Venice, who had arrived in the Indian Ocean in the 1470s, had uh, spent a lot of time in Hormuz, in the Persian Gulf, in Gujarat, in Southeast Asia, had married an Asian women, had children, had not baptized them, and uh, was living there perfectly uh, happy when the Portuguese arrived and then proceeded to actually finally make common cause with the Portuguese and return to Portugal uh, with them, uh, where the Portuguese were very scandalized by the fact that he had these half-naked, non-baptized children, of course. Now, these contacts we now know quite a lot about. So what it means is that in the centuries preceding the arrival of the Portuguese, there were actually fairly regular but low-level contacts between Europe and India. And this is another example of those. Very famously, the Jewish traders of the Eastern Mediterranean actually kept regular contacts with this part of the, of the world. Uh, of course, uh, in general, with the southwestern coast of India, but in, as you will, some of you will know, in particular, with uh, some centers on the uh, coast of Kerala, like, uh, like uh, Kranganur or Korangalur. Uh, and uh, in fact, we know about this because of the fact that uh, a number of their letters have survived in a collection which is famously known as the Geniza of Cairo. And these letters were analyzed very extensively by a very well-known scholar called Shlomo Goitain. And now we have uh, very uh, significant details showing these regular contacts then between these traders in the Eastern Mediterranean 
and, uh, and India. So in that sense, you might ask, were what the Portuguese were doing really new? So the answer has got to be, in a sense, yes and no. What they were doing was, of course, new to them. It was new to them because remember that this trade that we're talking about uh, involved the Eastern Mediterranean and it involved places as far as Italy. But the uh, Western part of the Mediterranean, which is to say uh, the Kingdom of Castile and the Kingdom of Portugal, which we see over here, were in fact not involved particularly in this trade until certainly the beginning of the 15th century. They were disadvantaged. They were actually very far away from a purely geopolitical point of view. They could not really compete with the people in the Eastern Mediterranean. And so in a sense, therefore, this is the reason why they set out to, in a manner of speaking, get around this problem. That is to say, since you can actually move from the Eastern Mediterranean to Southwestern India with a relative degree of facility using the route of the uh, Persian Gulf that you see over there, or using the route of the Red Sea, uh, it's highly unlikely that someone from here is going to bother to go all the way out there to actually do this. Whereas if you are located where the Portuguese are, which is, in a sense, in the western tip of Eurasia, it makes a great deal of sense to do this. Right? So we know how the Portuguese actually got into this. We know that they had considerable disadvantages in doing this. We know that they were actually quite um, hampered by the fact that they did not have a great deal of information, but we know that they persisted, uh, that uh, this was partly done through crown patronage, it was partly done through the patronage of some of the princes of the royal house who had significant resources, the most famous of whom is someone who has often been misnamed Prince Henry the Navigator, someone who never navigated so far as we know, but who actually patronized others, and uh, who uh, therefore uh, was part of this process by which the Portuguese pushed down the coast of Africa through the 15th century without any notion of how far they have to go to get around Africa, constantly thinking they've reached the end of Africa, constantly being disappointed, until eventually, at the end of the 1480s, Bartholomew Diaz arrives around the Cape of Good Hope and just crosses a little bit into the Indian Ocean. Now, we also know that what happens after that. What happens after that is the next stage, which takes another 10 years. These are mysterious 10 years. There's a hiatus, and then this expedition is eventually sent out, which is the expedition of Vasco da Gama, which arrives uh, around this, goes up the east coast of Africa, gathering information at every spot, meeting local people, eventually coming into an, uh, into an economy and a society where uh, Arabic is available as a language of communication. And there are some people in the fleet who speak Arabic. They have a little bit of a problem because they speak the Arabic of uh, the Maghreb. They speak the Arabic of, of, uh, of, the, uh, of northwestern Africa, whereas the Arabic which is spoken in, in the Indian Ocean is much more akin to the Arabic of, let's say, Syria or Lebanon or the Hejaz. So they eventually come then and arrive in, in, in India. Now the question, of course, is this. Uh, if we were in America, we could see why nobody would say anything about them, because the societies of the Caribbean did not have writing. The societies of Mexico did not also have writing uh, which was easily recognizable for a long time, though now it is clear that at least some parts, in particular uh, the Mayans, had some forms of, of, of written communication. It seems that the, the people, peoples of, of Peru also had some forms of, of uh, preserving uh, memory, though again uh, these famous quipus are rather difficult to decipher. Now this is not at all the case in the parts of India where Vasco da Gama arrives, because we know that the societies of Kerala in which he, to which he comes uh, have an extensive literature by this time in Malayalam, but also in Sanskrit. Uh, there are many people there who also speak and use uh, Tamil as a language. Uh, and of course, uh, what is also the case is that you have a number of other different languages which are being practiced there. There are uh, Jews present in small numbers who are actually uh, the same people in some senses who are in communication with the people, the traders of the Geniza. Hmm? Not the same people as the, uh, of the traders of the Geniza, but others who were in communication with them. There were other uh, communities, notably of Christians, who were actually using Syriac as a liturgical and uh, language of preserving memory and also of communication. And of course, there were Arabic speakers in this area. So, in fact, there is, in some sense, theoretically no problem. 
There is no real reason why in such a literate society, in such a society in which uh, uh, manuscripts and palm leaves and so on were common enough, uh, there should not have been some record of the arrival of the Portuguese. And yet there isn't. And yet there isn't. That is to say, there is no record of the first Portuguese fleet arriving in Goa. So what is it that we do have? So what is it that we can actually get our hands on? So I'm going to talk you my way through a, a few of these and then see what we can actually do with them. But finally, I'm also going to make an argument that one of the ways in which we can understand how the Indians saw or discovered Vasco da Gama is actually by a creative reading of the Portuguese texts themselves. Right? So let's start by going through these texts very rapidly. The first of these is a text called the uh, Tafad al-Mujahideen which is uh, roughly um, translated as a gift to the holy warriors. It's written by a man called uh, Sheikh Zainuddin, Zainuddin Mahabari. And uh, it's a text which was probably written only about 75 years after the arrival of Vashka Begama. So it's not contemporary, it's about 75 years later. But it's a very interesting text because it's in two parts. The second part of it, which most people have focused their attention on, is a kind of chronicle. So it tells you when the Portuguese arrived, what they did, and so on and so forth. It is, of course, very anti-Portuguese. There's no doubt about that. It sees them in, 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 in very, very negative terms, and it sees them as people who are creating a problem, particularly in terms of uh, commercial rivalry, okay? because we know that the Portuguese actually, uh, within uh, a couple of years of arriving, uh, made uh, demands on some of the rulers of Kerala, uh, asking them for exclusive rights to trading in certain commodities, and this created uh, a serious problem. We also know, incidentally, that in the beginning, the Portuguese thought that there were two kinds of Muslims in India, and that it was very useful to distinguish between these two kinds of Muslims. They were what they used to call Moruj, the Mecca. So these were the Middle Eastern Muslims, whom they called as the Meccan Muslims. And they were what they would call Moruj the Terra, which is to say the local Muslims, what we would today call Mapilas. So they initially were under the impression that the real problem was with the Moruj the Mecca, that these people who were the Middle Eastern Muslims were their fundamental uh, rivals because they were the ones with whom they had uh, a problem in terms of the, uh, the long distance trade. But actually, within about 15 or 20 years, uh, they began to have very serious difficulties with the other set of Muslim traders as well, with the Mapilas as well. And this author actually is from the Mapila community. Right? So, though he's writing in Arabic, he is from the Mapila community. He's someone who has also got a theological education. Now, there's a very interesting first part of this text, however, which people have not sometimes paid adequate attention to. And this part is actually a kind of theoretical part. It's a theological part, actually, where uh, Zainuddin actually tells us what jihad is. It's a very interesting text, of course, in a certain sense, with contemporary resonances as well. So he actually tries to tell us why is it necessary to have a jihad at this time. So he tells us effectively that the world is divided up into different uh, uh, geographical sections, and that the uh, Afranj, the Franks, the Europeans, have their part of the world. And of course, uh, if uh, one is uh, you know, a devout Muslim, one should also go out and think about conquering that part of the world. But it's not actually terribly necessary. You can actually leave them pretty much where they are, and you can live in your space and leave them to their space. However, he says, if the Frank enters your space, at this point, he says, it is no longer uh, a, uh, a desirable, it is actually an absolute necessity. And he actually makes this very interesting uh, claim. He says that everyone has to make war on them. Women, children, slaves do not have to ask for the permission of their master. Uh, all of them must make war on them. Because in a certain sense, what they have done is they have breached the space. This is actually also re related to a um, rather complicated uh, other story, which, uh, which I can keep for the discussion if any of you is interested, which is that there was a widespread view amongst some of the writers of this period that actually what had happened was uh, that the uh, Portuguese had actually breached, literally breached a wall, which had been built by Alexander the Great. Right? There was the view that Alexander the Great had actually built a wall in order to separate different parts of the world. He had done this on the advice of Aristotle. 
and uh, this is what is often called the Suddha uh, Secondary. And what had actually happened in this, in this, in the process of coming around Africa, is that the Portuguese had breached Alexander's Wall. So there's also a kind of a literal sense in which, in which something is happening in terms of two spaces which are meant to kept, be kept apart and to be kept separate uh, are being uh, put into a kind of a communication which they should ideally not have, have seen. Now, the second text is a less known and a more uh, curious text. It's a text which is roughly of the same period, and the difference between the second text and the first one, so again from the 1570s, 1580s, is that this one is actually written in poetry. Right? So it's a poetic text, Fat al-Mubin. Actually, the full title of it is uh, uh, Fat al-Mubin li al-Samiri al-lazi yuhibu al-Muslimin, the manifest victory for the Samiri who loves Muslims. Right? So it's making the argument that the Samudri Raja is a friend of the Muslims. This is a text which is much more uh, um, playful in a certain way, uh, but it is also uh, a rather, uh, again, a, a violent uh, text in terms of its perception of the Portuguese. I'll read you a couple of uh, a verse from it. Uh, here's a description of the Portuguese as it appears in the Fat al-Mubin. They are the worst of all creatures, followers of the most unclean ways, the bitterest foes of Allah and his prophet, his faith and his prophet's community. The Frank, that is to say the Portuguese, worships the cross and prostrates before images and idols. This is re a reference in particular to the Virgin. Hmm? So the Frank worships the cross and prostrates before images and idols. Ugly in appearance and form, blue-eyed like a ghoul, he urinates standing like a dog. So this is also a, a matter of differences in habits, whereas people urinate sitting down, these are people who urinate standing up. And those who wash are expelled and rebuked. Right? So there's this is whole notion of them being unclean. Cunning, disobedient, and deceitful, the filthiest of God's creatures. That is the Frank. Hmm? Or you have uh, another verse which says, the Frank came to Malabar in guise of a merchant, but intending cheating and trickery to gather all the pepper and ginger for himself and leave just coconuts for the others. In the year 903 from the year of the migration of the prophet, the chosen of humankind, the Frank brought some presents for the Samiri and asked to be one of his subjects. Okay. And it says, uh, he lay low like a slave until one day, growing in strength, he rose up and subdued the lands of Hind and Sindh and even China. That is no lie. So here we have this very uh, sort of rhetorically uh, elevated, uh, very violent text, which uh, presents the whole problem in terms of uh, people who are honest and people who are dishonest, people who are truthful and people who are de deceitful, and so on. So it's a rather simple set of, of oppositions. Now, did everybody think like this? Clearly not. Right? So let me take you through very quickly the third of these texts. Now, this is a Syriac letter written about three or four years after the arrival of Bashar the Gama. And it is a letter written by the bishops of the Syrian Christian community in Kerala. Right? So remember that there was this very old Christian community in Kerala at this time who were uh, practicing a different rite, who were not Catholics, who were actually linked to the Eastern Church, and who used periodically to receive bishops from uh, what would today be Iraq. Right? So these bishops would be sent by the Catholicos in, in uh, Iraq to uh, Kerala and would uh, then uh, provide the, uh, the leadership of the overall church, though the church itself on a regular basis was run by these uh, priests, uh, these Katanars, who were actually uh, from the elite of the Syrian Christian community itself. So we actually have a letter written in Syriac by the bishops of the community to their head in Iraq. And this is a letter which, as I said, comes about five years after the arrival of the Portuguese. And it's a very different letter in tone, because it actually says that uh, this is a wonderful thing. These people have arrived. They are actually uh, going to put us in touch with a much larger community of Christians. They are actually going to make us, uh, in a sense, uh, give us commercial advantages because of the fact that the Syrians the Syrian Christians were extremely heavily involved in the trade in pepper. Uh, they were the people who used to bring the pepper from the inland uh, to the coast. So they actually thought that they were going to get co you know, uh, commercial advantages out of this relationship. And so they 
put forward an extremely positive vision of the Portuguese. And in fact, the whole question of treachery and loyalty is inverted in their way. And they claim that the poor Samudri, in fact, is being misled by his Muslim advisors. So in fact, the Samudri is this innocent uh, ruler who doesn't know what is good for him. He should actually be allying with the Portuguese. But instead of doing that, misled by his Muslim rulers, he's actually, or what they call Ismailites is the term that they use. Uh, he's actually making uh, the wrong set of decisions and so on. So we do have some kind of sense here of uh, a diversity of points of view, depending on a diversity of interests. Now, we could, of course, extend this even further. I mean, there are, for instance, within the first 10 or 15 years of uh, the Portuguese arrival, we have letters actually written by people in Kerala to them. Hmm? Now, it's very interesting to see that uh, these letters are actually written in Arabic. Right? So for instance, this is a letter, um, which to my knowledge has actually never been, been uh, translated, uh, which is written by the ruler of Kannur, or Kananur in the northern part of Kerala. So this is the so-called um, Kolatiri ruler of, of northern Kerala. And this is actually a letter from him to the Portuguese, but written in Arabic. Right? And in this letter, he actually talks about uh, the need for them to build a commercial alliance. He talks about uh, how, in fact, uh, the, uh, uh, he's had some difficulty with some of the Portuguese captains and so on. But overall, uh, what he's actually seeing is uh, the possibility of a, a positive dealing with the Portuguese, a strategic dealing with them, which, of course, is in, seen in terms of his own geopolitical vision, because he's actually looking to see where he can gain an advantage over the Samudri. So he's actually looking to see the extent to which he can build up his commercial uh, network in northern Kerala as opposed to central Kerala, which is where the Samudri of Calicut has, uh, has his, his dominant position. So we can actually uh, start putting these, these images together. And what we get out of them is then not always the most expected of uh, results. We do get some diversity, but there is, of course, a certain amount of predictability, which is you get these notions of the Portuguese indeed as being untrustworthy, problematic, and so on. But what I actually want to do is to suggest to you that we can actually take matters a step further than that. So we can do the literal thing, which is to say we can actually go and say, OK, let's keep the Portuguese vision out of it for a moment and just look at what the other people have to say. This is, would be one way of doing it. But what I'm going to suggest to you is that it's actually not necessarily to, necessary to go that far at all. That it is actually possible even to rethink uh, how we read the Portuguese texts themselves. So uh, let me devote a little bit of time then to the last of the texts that I have over here, which is the so-called anonymous text. This is the text which is now being elevated by the UNESCO into one of the world's treasures or whatever it is, and which the correspondents of the Hindu in Kerala are terribly interested in. So this is a text which is uh, from the 16th century. It was written by someone who was on board the fleet of Ashwagandha. It's not the original copy. It's a later copy from the 16th century. We don't know who the author is. Many people think that the author is a man called Alvaro Velho, who uh, was a minor scribe on board the ship. And it's a very, very interesting and strange text because of the fact that it's incredibly raw. Right? So let me just give you a little bit of a sense of that, and also a little bit of a sense of a, without going too deep into it, a, a sort of a, a theoretical perspective on this question. So, when we get texts, Portuguese texts from the 16th century, some of them are incredibly polished. They are very well put together. So for example, the great Portuguese chroniclers, like João do Barros, writing in the middle of the 16th century, are high rhetoricians. They have a very good education. And they actually write these very tight texts, which are uh, meant to serve a very definite ideological purpose. They know exactly what they're doing. So that's one kind of text. But the text that we're dealing with over here is what, and here I'm borrowing a little bit the uh, vocabulary of the Italian historian Carlo Ginzburg, is a text that has, as he says, cracks. Right? It's a text that has cracks. And because of these cracks, it doesn't speak to us in one voice. It speaks to us in, a, in what, uh, what the literary theorist uh, Michael Bakhtin would have called in a polyphonic way. It actually has various voices in it. So let me give you a sense of what I mean by this. What I mean by this is that this is a text which actually keeps on telling us about misunderstandings. 
It tells us how actually the Portuguese don't understand a lot of what they're seeing. The most famous misunderstanding of all, which many of you would know about, is the fact that he tells us in very explicit terms that the Portuguese were taken to something which, if you read the text, you can see very clearly is some kind of a temple. Uh, it is very clearly a temple, which is, it is a temple which, which seems to have a, a Garuda on a Stamba outside it, so it's probably a Vishnu temple. But Vashuka Gama thinks it's a, ch it's a church. So he goes in thinking it's a church. He proceeds to think it's a church. They won't let him into the temple, of course. So he only sees something at a, at a distance, and he thinks it's the virgin. But he's not absolutely sure. And then he looks at the walls of the temple and says, oh, these must be saints. But he says, but these are saints which have very long teeth and a lot of arms. Hmm? Uh, and this is the kind of thing which is actually uh, reported in this text, which actually shows us a Vashka the Gama who actually doesn't understand what he's seeing, which shows us someone who is convinced that he's seeing Christians where there are no Christians. Of course, there are Christians, as we've seen. There were Christians, but he was often thinking that Christians were not there when, in fact, they were. So this text is actually very interesting from that point of view because, for instance, it shows us some very strange things. It shows us Vashadagama telling lies, right? This is the Portuguese text, so we don't actually have to go to the Tafat al-Mujahideen or the Fat al-Mubin to see that. So here's what the Portuguese text tells us. He says, if you go back to that moment when he's making that famous speech in front of the Samudri Raja, so what is he actually telling him, right? So he, what he's telling him is things like this, and I'm just quoting here from the Portuguese text. He says that Vashadagama told the Samurin that the king of Portugal was much richer in all things than any other king of Europe. Now, this is, of course, manifestly untrue, right? And the Portuguese know very well that the king of Portugal is certainly not as rich as the king of Castile or the king of France. Hmm? And then um, he also says that we have not come here to trade. We're not interested really very much in trade. Uh, we don't want gold and silver because we have so much gold and silver in Portugal we don't need anymore. Right? So uh, what we've actually come here for is only to find Christians. So he's already shifted his ground from that first moment when they say Christians and spices. So the spices have been put away for a little bit and we're only talking about Christians. He also says uh, to the king, uh, to the Samudri, that he uh, has to be very careful because if he goes back to Portugal without finding the right things, the king of Portugal will cut his head off. So these are the kinds of things which he is actually, uh, which we actually see presented in the Portuguese text, a text in which you have a Vashra the Gama who is presented then as exaggerating, manipulating, and so on, and therefore, in some senses, a text which is not as sophisticated by any means as what the later Portuguese uh, would do. So what we then have to bear in mind is this, that it is certainly important, and I continue to believe it is absolutely important, to look for uh, materials which are non-Portuguese materials concerning the trade of the Indian Ocean in the 16th century. And we will continue to find it. There's no doubt about it. We will continue to find materials in Arabic, in Persian, and indeed in Malayalam, in Tamil, and in other languages. We will not necessarily find materials that will actually give us a sense of that moment of encounter. But as I said, perhaps we don't necessarily actually always need that. Because here, for example, is again, returning to the Portuguese text. Here's how the Portuguese text tells us the Indian Ocean looked like in 1500. So first, we have to see where they got this from. They got this information from someone who is mentioned in this anonymous text, who is a Jewish spy, who meets the Portuguese when the Portuguese are on their way back near Goa in the so-called Anjadiv Islands, they meet this man who it turns out is a Jew. There's some debate about his origins. Some people think that he was from, from the Eastern Mediterranean, but there's also a theory that he was actually from Poland, uh, from Poznan. So this man who was uh, found out by the Portuguese as a spy, for forcibly converted and given the name of Gaspar which is not a coincidence, because remember that Kashpar is one of the Magi. He's one of the three kings of the Orient. So you know we are looking for uh, something like Jesus and the three kings of the Orient. So Kashpar gives them this picture of what the geopolitics of India is. And this is the geopolitics of India. Kanganur has a Christian king. Kolum has a Christian king. Koromandel has a Christian king. Ceylon has a Christian king. Sumatra has a Christian king. Siam, which he calls Sharnaus or Shehrenav, 
the, the Persian term, uh, that Thailand has a Christian king. Hmm? Bengal has a Christian king, but Muslim subjects. Malacca has a Christian king. Burma has a Christian king. Everybody is Christian in the Indian Ocean. Right? So, uh, and where are we getting this from? We are getting this not from anywhere else, but we are getting this from the Portuguese text itself. And what we are actually able to see then is the extent of the first set of misunderstandings. And what do these misunderstandings result from? These misunderstandings result from a, an overwhelming desire to see something, to find something. And that overwhelming desire, for a time at least, for a time, can trump empirical facts. You can transform a Vaishnava temple into a Christian church in your own vision. But not for long. Because when the Portuguese come back two years later, or three years later, or five years later, they're going to realize that this is an absolute uh, bill of goods they've been sold, that this has actually got nothing to do with the realities of the Indian Ocean, that the, first of all, you will see that in this, uh, in this set of categories, there are only Muslims and Christians. Hmm? You will notice that there are no people who are not Muslim and Christians in this vision of the world. Then the Portuguese will decide, yes, there are other people, and they will call them by this funny category of what they call gentio, or, or, or gentile. Hmm. and which will eventually, they will realize, uh, it can be broken up into different kinds of Gentiles that the people who follow the Buddha are not the people who follow what we would call the Hindu gods and so on. So it doesn't remain this forever, but it is very much, very much present. And so uh, while we must continue to look, for example, in uh, the... the um, um, kingdoms and the archives of, of India in places like the Deccan, in places like Ahmad Nagar, with which the Portuguese had extensive contacts and so on, uh, and indeed in places like Kerala, where you see here the, the, uh, the Jewish uh, synagogue, uh, where again uh, we continue to have uh, reports of the Portuguese uh, presence. Uh, it is actually, I think, uh, nevertheless uh, useful and, and uh, possible uh, to rethink how one reads the Portuguese materials themselves. So uh, in some senses, we have to operate on the two fronts, taking advantage of the cracks in the Portuguese texts, and realizing, of course, that some Portuguese texts have more cracks than others. Right? So for instance, uh, I would, uh, it's not entirely impossible, for instance, even to take the famous Portuguese uh, national epic, the Luzia, of which you see a page over here, and realize that even that is a more complicated text than it appears at first sight, because there is a famous passage in the Luzia, in which the fleet of Vasco da Gama is going to set out, and an old man appears and he says to them, don't go, don't go. And uh, they say, and they, are, when he, they ask him, he sets out in this long tirade, and he says that you are going to ruin Portugal by setting out. That what is going to happen is that you will go out into the overseas, you will empty this country, uh, and what will actually happen is that you will have this vain glory of commanding, which became the title of a very famous film in Portugal, uh, much later, uh, this vain glory of commanding will be yours, but you will actually ruin yourselves in this process. You've got to ask yourself, what is the national poet of Portugal doing, inserting uh, such a voice into his national epic as well? Right? So we can, in fact, creatively read these texts and thus come to a rather different vision of this, this empire, which uh, we saw in its first moments, but which would eventually become a funny kind of worldwide empire by the end of the 16th century, and uh, which would, of course, eventually be put paid to by uh, the Dutch and the English uh, in, the, in the next century. Okay. But uh, that is uh, another story, as they say. Thank you. Thank you for a fascinating uh, talk. Uh, I was wondering um, if you could, uh, I'm curious about the monetary, relative monetary value of spices uh, during that time. I mean, if something uh, drove uh, these explorers to come all the way to India, it must have been incredibly valuable. Um, I, I recall reading that in Europe at that time, the, the currency of bribery was not gold or silver like you mentioned, but actually judges were bribed with spices. Uh, and if you can also context it with today's prices, for instance, um, I was in Kerala maybe five or six years ago, uh, McCormick, which is the Baltimore Spice Company, has a plant uh, outside Kochi. Uh, and I, I was astonished to find out that India's total uh, spice exports five years ago 
was only $500 million. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, I, just before coming, I checked uh, this year's figure is $2 billion, but it still seems so little. Uh, California probably exports almonds worth more. Um, so tell us about the pricing, why it was so uh, expensive, um, and if you can context it with today's prices. Uh, actually, it's, it should be notionally possible to, to index it in some way and come to some, some comparison, but uh, off the top of my head, I wouldn't very easily be able to tell you that. But it's, 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 it's uh, notionally feasible because we have the prices of the 16th century, and we can notionally build some long-term price indexes which would allow us some, some way of doing that. Uh, however, uh, it's true that from a certain point of view, the quantities which are involved are not big quantities. Right? So bear this in mind. So what we're talking about is pepper, which is actually the most traded in terms of sheer quantities. And then in uh, the case of India, okay, all you have besides pepper, which the Portuguese are interested in, um, is um, they're interested in cinnamon, which comes from Sri Lanka. Hmm? And they're interested in ginger, in, in, in dried ginger to some extent. The rest of the spices actually don't come from India for the most part, but from Southeast Asia. So the other spices which they're interested in are cloves, nutmeg, and mace, all of which come from the Moluccas from Eastern Indonesia, and which are traded in much smaller quantities, but with much higher profit margins, much higher profit margins than pepper. Right? So in fact, uh, when you're talking about you know, what this actually involves finally, it involves um, uh, even at the height of the trade. So Vashtagama comes on an exploratory mission. He has about three ships. Okay. Uh, the later uh, missions, are, um, later fleets are going to be larger. But at the most, uh, in any given year, there might be 11, 12, 13 ships. Uh, that's about the size of it. Right? And uh, the, the, the amount of, of pepper which is actually being, which is, which is actually being transported is um, off the order of between, I would say, about 1,200 and 1,500 tons a year. That's the pepper. Okay, uh, in comparison to a production which is probably about uh, 10 times that amount. So the Portuguese take of it is about 10% of the total production. Okay, um, but you could say that, you know, in terms of the comparisons that neither the absolute uh, numbers nor even what the Portuguese are taking in that sense is that significant. But of course the problem then is actually seeing what the size of the Portuguese trading economy itself globally is at that, st uh, is at that point. And so from that perspective, uh, you, know, you can make a fortune still uh, on this. And the Portuguese king, whom the French king very contemptuously described as the le roi épicier, the grocer king, hmm? uh, the king who has his own, you know, uh, his own dukan, huh? uh, was someone who was actually, uh, it, it was important enough for him to be directly put his hands directly in this business, right? So in some senses, if you're actually looking at it from that point of view, uh, it's, not, uh, it's certainly not uh, huge. On the other hand, if you think about it, the number of men who are involved in an expedition like this, I mean, you're sending out about 200 and something people, about uh, more than half of them get killed, one way or the other, between scurvy and disease and so on. Uh, but it's not a huge expense, uh, either in terms of, of, of of men for, for even a kingdom which is very small like Portugal. So everything has to be seen in a world of much smaller dimensions. Right? But so far as your, your question is concerned regarding uh, what the prices were uh, compared to the prices of today, I would have to look the matter up. But I can tell you that the profit margins are very, very serious profit margins. So between the prices of purchase in, in Kerala and the prices of sale, let's say, in Antwerp, you're talking about a markup of you know maybe um, a thousand percent. So, I don't know if that helps you. Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah. I was in uh, Guruvayur last week, and uh, there is a temple bell in Guruvayur called Vasco da Gama's bell, and it has an, a Portuguese inscription on it. And I was wondering, given the very strict rules for temple entry in Kerala, and you know they're very particular about what they let into the temple. I wonder how that bell got there in the first place, and uh, do, are you aware of the history of no, this? No, I would have to read the inscription to see what it is. It's possible that it's a ship's bell. Poss poss uh, or possibly that it was even cast in Kerala, because it looks like a bronze bell from Kerala, okay. but it has a Portuguese inscription on it, not from Vasco da Gama, although it's popularly yes. called as 
Vasco da Gama's yes. death. Yes. No, I'm, I actually, I, I, I would have to uh, look into it and see what the inscription actually it's says. It's actually mentioned in Pepita Seth's book, okay. Heaven on Earth. Uh, well, I'll, I'll have to look that up then. Yeah. But I mean, uh, as you know, I mean, you know, uh, on a slightly different note, you know, people uh, about what is Latin and what is not Latin and so on. You know, famously, people always said uh, for a long time that you know Indians or Hindus would never travelled overseas because of the question of of uh, the um, you know the Kalapani or whatever it was. Well, actually, the fact of the matter is that Indians were constantly travelling overseas uh, when the Portuguese arrive in, for instance, in Aden uh, or on the banks of the Red Sea. There's a Banya community over there. Now they didn't get there over land; they got there over water. There are there are Indians, uh, the, the, there are Gujaratis in East Africa. Right? What are these people doing there? Well, it's basically because, I mean, uh, you know, that you, for every dosha, there is a prize chitta. Uh, and uh, you, can always, you can always get around these things. Yeah. Uh, professor, yeah. uh, I love Urdu language, so it is a regard historical perspective for the Urdu. Urdu, as you know, is a mixture of Arabic and Persian and then Indianized. And Urdu must be over there in the subcontinent. The question is, why is still in Kerala and Tamil Nadu, Urdu is not a culture part of that state? Uh, even though Madam Ambassador knows Urdu very well, uh, but other states, they do have this kind of a cultural expression of Urdu and Hindi. Yeah. And second question is, when you started learning Urdu? Thank you. Uh, so far as, as why it isn't there, you see, I mean, after all, uh, the spread of Urdu, uh, I mean, Urdu, you can find Urdu speakers in the northern, northern part of Tamil Nadu, for instance. Uh, but the people who are there uh, are linked to uh, the late Mughal expansion and also to the expansion of the, uh, of the Deccan Sultanates, because both in Bijapur and in Golconda, people were using Dakani, which is uh, akin to Urdu in, in, in many respects. There was no such process, actually, of contact with, with Kerala. So actually, Kerala's contact was maritime, and it was, uh, therefore, especially with the Arab-speaking lands. This is exactly the same situation as the southern tip of Tamil Nadu. If you actually go to the area between uh, you know, towns like Kirakare or Tutukudi uh, or Kail Patnam, the extreme, actually where uh, the former president uh, Abdul Kalam comes from that, that area, these are areas where uh, Arabic had a dominant influence, as was the case, for example, also in the west coast of Sri Lanka, where the Muslims there actually uh, are in contact with the Arabic-speaking lands. And since Urdu is actually linked to what we would today call a, a, a neo-Indo-Aryan language, that is to say it's, 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 um, you know, its syntactical structure comes from is shared with Hindi, so uh, there is actually no no uh, such thing. But actually, what what is really interesting is that for those of you who know uh, Tamil literature, there were people who actually in uh, the 17th and 18th century uh, worked between Tamil and Arabic, and there are texts which are written in Tamil but in Arabic script. Hmm? And of course, there are famous poets. Uh, there is a very famous 17th century poet called Umar Upalavar who actually wrote, for example, a biography of the prophet, which is called the Sira Purana, which is a um, text in which he shows a knowledge. On the one hand, he's borrowing many of the structures, the similes from Kamba Ramayana. But on the other hand, uh, he actually knows his Arabic very well. So there is a whole other history to be told of another contact, which is not the same story exactly as the Northern Indian story. And I think that it's an interesting uh, question also of this multiplicity of contacts. Yeah. Another question, uh, when you speak about Arabic Tamil, there's also Arabic Malayalam. Yes, indeed, indeed. There's all, and uh, the other thing is, have you studied the Mapala part, uh, you know, the Mapala songs of Kerala, which also talk a lot about voyaging and going to faraway lands, and there's a whole, you know, uh, tradition that is uh, reflected in yes. that kind of uh, folk music. And the third point was in Sri Lanka, you spoke of Western Sri Lanka, but you look at Eastern Sri Lanka, you look at Batikalo and yes. all these places. There are also Muslims with a lot of ties to Kerala, originally, and even matrilineal traditions. And uh, so that's another, you know, the fishing traditions of these communities have linked 
uh, people, uh, you know, on the other side of the island also with, uh, with yes. Karen. Yes. Um, though actually, they, I mean, in terms of the Portuguese, their main problems were because they were trying to control the area around Colombo. So their main problems were with the old Kote Kingdom. And so with the, with the Muslims who were actually in that part, and also then to some extent because they tried to control the pearl fishery in the Gulf of Manar. So they were also, they had difficulties with the great um, Muslim households of uh, Kirakara and Kyle Putnam and so on. I have actually not myself directly worked on the Mapula materials, but actually other historians have. So there is some literature on it, not as good as it should be, but it does exist. Uh, Professor, yes. uh, would you speculate on why Indian languages like Tamil or uh, uh, Malayalam or even um, Devanagari, uh, you don't have so many references to cite. You're citing other languages. You're citing other languages yes. rather than these three predominant languages in the region. S sorry, which of the three again? Uh, Malayalam, yes. Tamil, yes. and some sort of Devanagari. Oh, you mean Hindi? Yes, um, but Hindavi. since uh -huh. Devanagari was the, uh, the no, script Devnagri, of the gods. Devanagari is a script. Uh, 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 it's a script of the yeah. gods, though. See, yeah. So there can be a difference. No, you can write anything in Nagari. You can write so, Marathi in Nagari. So, uh, uh, so and, why, why, why not that? Yes. And let, let me ask a related, not a related question, a different question. Uh, I think Vasco was also surprised to discover the quantum of gemstones and how important was that discovery vis-a-vis, -vis, say, the spice trade? Actually, uh, in, in fact, in the, in the accounts of the first voyage, to take your second question first, in the accounts of the first voyage, there's not that much insistence on gemstones. It actually happens later for a number of different reasons, because the gemstones which they're interested in, many of them come from Sri Lanka or from Burma, in, with which they are not in contact at this point. Then there is the diamond mining of the Deccan, but that's the interior, right? So the diamond mining, which would today be broadly in the sort of borderlands of Andhra Pradesh and Karnataka, that area. But again, the Portuguese, it took them at least, I would say, eight or 10 years to get interested in that. So in fact, the, when it becomes interesting is when the first Portuguese ambassador, who is a Franciscan called Fari Luis do Salvador, is sent to Vijayanagar, to the capital of Vijayanagar. And when he gets to Vijayanagar, there he finds that there is a very active diamond trade. And uh, he then becomes interested, he's not only a Franciscan, but he also becomes a gem trader. And uh, then there's a whole long story which goes after that because of the fact that one of the nice things about the gem trade is uh, it's very useful to smuggle your wealth back. So it, this is something which the English also do much later. You know, very famously, uh, some of you will know the fact that uh, uh, this uh, place called Yale University was once Yale College, and it was founded by the governor of Madras, uh, Elihu Yale, who smuggled a good part of his illegal wealth back in the form of diamonds, right? uh, with the help of his friend who was called William, but his nickname was Diamond Pit. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but you have to wait a little bit. So it's not immediately, because at this point, they are still on the coast. They haven't actually entered the interior. And for the gems, they have to get there. Now, why do we not find more references so far as the northern Indian languages are concerned, uh, it's because the Portuguese don't have much to do with that area until maybe the end of the 16th century, when the Portuguese actually come into contact with uh, places like Lahore and Delhi and Agra and so on. Uh, where you would expect to see more is in Gujarat, but you find it in Gujarat, but in the Persian writings in Gujarat. And also there is a well-known Arabic chronicle in Gujarat uh, written by someone called uh, Hajid Dabir uh, Uluhani, where there are mentions of the Portuguese. Uh, so it's very strange what you get and what you don't get. In Bengali, on the other hand, there are uh, quite a lot of mentions of the Portuguese, uh, but it's usually as slave traders. So there's you know, this Portuguese, this whole idea of the Portuguese with the uh, armadas, which are called harmad in Bengali, and how these Portuguese come and raid and take away slaves. And this is a kind of an oral, important oral tradition in the Bengali language. So it's a bit of a mystery because you see, I mean, part of our problem is you can always explain why something happens. It's much more difficult to explain why something doesn't happen. You know, it's like my, if I were to ask the question, you know, these Portuguese came to India, why didn't the Indians go to Portugal? I don't know. 
Thank you. You were talking about the indigenous uh, Muslims there, and those texts sounded rather bellicose, but weren't they in fact kicked out of Cochin by, uh, by the Portuguese, and that's when they went to the enemy of Cochin and the Portuguese uh, in Calicut. In fact, the Jews and the Portuguese were both allied with, the, with Cochin. And I wondered if you have any thoughts about recently, there's been talk about, it was a sta an Indian stamp issued in terms for the uh, Muslims, traitors and, quote, pirates, to making them into sort of a proto-nationalist fighter of the Portuguese. Yeah, there's, uh, um, actually, this goes back to the 1960s when there was a man called uh, uh, O.K. Nambiar who wrote a book which is called uh, Portuguese Pirates and Indian Seamen, where he tried to make the argument that the uh, Portuguese were the real pirates, and they were the ones who were breaking the current understanding of the laws and so on. So it was, he was trying to make that, make that argument. And the main reference is to, of course, to two dynasties uh, which, which arise, and so one of them actually is the so-called, uh, what are called the Ayi Rajas of Kannur, so for, to the north, so there's a whole, there's one bunch of them, sorry, you can't see it, unless we can switch this back on. Uh, but there's another bunch of them in, in central Kerala, which are actually the people who are writing these texts, who are from the area around Ponani. So who are actually in this very tense relationship, and who eventually will, I mean, it's a very long and complicated story, but eventually the, the, the Samudri Rajas will turn against them by the end of the 16th century, because they feel that in the process of fighting the Portuguese, they've gained too much power. And so uh, eventually the, there's a moment in which the, one of the so-called Kunjali Marikars is actually betrayed by the Samudri Raja to the Portuguese because he can't deal with him either. But it's true that these very bellicose texts actually typically emanate from one nucleus, which is the central Kerala, central Kerala area. Yeah. Um, I have a question, thank you. Dr. Subramaniam. Um, Thank you for your excellent uh, lecture. I have uh, studied Vasco da Gama and Portuguese discoveries in college, and I have to say, after reading the historiography of uh, Boxer and Diffie, yours is one of the most original creative interpretations of that era. Um, two quick questions. Could it be that there were no local records about Vasco da Gama's arrival because you're talking about three ships, and you know the people at the time had no idea, thank you, that um, three ships would turn into a vast seaborne empire. I mean, had they known that, they may have written more about it. I mean, after all, the Portuguese discoveries from the Indian perspective were very anticlimactic, because the Indians, as you point out, had been traveling westward for a long time. The Portuguese had never been eastward. And the other question is, can we say categorically that Vasco da Gama was the first uh, European to sail, with a sail ship across the Indian Ocean? Because there were others, like you pointed out, Peru de Covillian is another person who, you know, who was, uh, European squire who traveled eastwards before Vasco da Gama, but had there been any Portuguese who traveled by, by sailboat eastwards to the Indian coast? Here, here's the difficulty. Um, so, yes, indeed, it's possible that you know, the, the reason why it's not mentioned is because the event itself at the time was not seen necessarily of, of significance. But actually what is interesting is that even the second Portuguese fleet, which actually is a much more violent affair, is not that much mentioned. I'm now actually working on something which I think may help us a little bit, which is that there is a, uh, a long four-generation uh, chronicle in Arabic from Mecca. Uh, there are four generations of people in the same family. These are the so-called uh, Banu Fahed, who keep uh, a chronicle, and they actually mention the arrival of the Portuguese indirectly around 1501 or two. Hmm? So, um, uh, yes, it's certainly possible that the first might not have been mentioned. Why the second and the third and the fourth and so on are not mentioned, why we are waiting till the 1570s is a little bit more difficult, a little bit more difficult to, to get at. Was he the first to cross? Um, who knows? Because, you know, the problem with the whole uh, business of uh, Pero de Covilla and so on is that uh, we don't know exactly what happened to these people. They disappeared, and then there were rumors about them afterwards. But if he crossed the Western Indian Ocean, uh, he certainly did not do so in his own ship. He did it in somebody else's ship. And it's certainly true that there were other Iberians there. So besides the man from Venice that I mentioned to you, Bonayuto de Albano, there was also somebody whom the Portuguese found from Valencia who was there. 
already from the 1580s or the 1590s. And we know that there were other, there were these two people, uh, Girolamo di Santo Stefano and Girolamo di Adorno, who were there in the 1490s. So it wouldn't surprise me if we found somebody who was notionally a Portuguese. Perhaps uh, as somebody mentioned even an Iberian Jew who might have uh, come across in terms of trade. We don't know currently, but it wouldn't surprise me. Sir, uh, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. Just a quick question. As much as you mentioned that uh, spices were taken by Portuguese, um, and I watched some of uh, your uh, interviews and documentaries, where you mentioning about some of the food ingredients which are still used in India were brought yes. by Portuguese. Yes. Could you please throw some light on that? Yeah. And well, of course, you know, that is part of the whole uh, complicated problem, which is this, that remember that by the time you get to about the 1530s or the 1540s, so not immediately, when the Iberians are in touch with America and then uh, also uh, with, with Asia and then in the 1560s, when this route opens up and becomes a regular route across the Pacific, so then you're actually going to get this kind of global spread of both, uh, both uh, uh, to some extent, animals and also uh, vegetables and fruit. So in fact, uh, as, you, as you will well know, I mean, there were, there were um, I mean, tomatoes and uh, potatoes and chilies were brought uh, in the course of this, uh, this exchange. Uh, less happily, tobacco was also brought as part of this exchange. Uh, and you know, uh, 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 and, and, uh, the, but mangoes were taken from India, yes, yes. Um, so, in fact, you have this exchange, and of course, famously, you get, you know, uh, these other, other uh, animals and birds. I mean, someone actually wrote a very funny article pointing out that this uh, bird, uh, you know, which they eat a lot in this country, which is the turkey. Now, the, this bird is called the turkey over here. What is it called in, in Turkish? Hindi. It's called Hindi. Yeah. Hmm? <laughs> Uh, so in, in Turkish, it is called Hindi. In, in English, it's called Turkey. In French, it's called Dand, which means from India. Hmm? So this is a bird which is, um, which is part of this exchange. In fact, there's a famous uh, episode in the court of Jahangir in which uh, they bring him a turkey, and he's so fascinated by it that he actually gets one of his painters to paint a portrait of this turkey. And we actually have this as part of the illustrations of the Jahangir Nama which is this turkey which you know, just struck them to such an extent. Thank God we don't you know, eat turkey in India. Mm, I mean, uh, I actually quite, uh, quite detest it. I, on Thanksgiving, I make it a point to cook chicken. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, this is part of the exchange which takes place. And some of it, is, some of it is, is interesting, but some of it is actually, of course, enormously destructive because some of these crops can you know, spread and, and destroy uh, other, other crops and so on. Uh, so it's a, it's a complicated thing. I mean, but on the other hand, I mean, think about it. Uh, you know, we think, uh, as I often say to my colleagues in, in, in American history, you know, people often think of the so-called, uh, uh, you know, the Indians of America, that is, you know, the Comanche or the Apache and so on, as being these horse cultures. But where did the horses come from? There were no horses before the Spaniards arrived. So in fact, what we think of as a traditional Native American culture is already a transformed culture. It's actually already the product of a previous encounter which, is, which has happened. Yeah. Okay. Let me just get this off. Uh, thank you. Uh, just to say that uh, this is one of the most interesting talks even personally I have listened to. And this is typically or an example of how you change the terms of the debate, right? I am on behalf of Ambassador Nirpama Rao, Embassy of India, and each and every one of you, I thank Dr. Sanjay Subramanian for this. And uh, you can continue your discussion over a small uh, refreshment we have arranged here. Thank you very much for everyone.